Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, we're celebrating communion this morning. And we, I believe people have misunderstood communion to the point of where it's become and more attention is given on the act of communion. It's almost like communion has become the sacred thing, just and the elements. And we focus on that, and that's not what Jesus wanted. That's not what it's for. It is not a religious... Communion is not a religion, a religious ceremony. It's why did Jesus say it to the disciples to have communion? Let's start by looking at 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23, and we'll read to 26. 1 Corinthians 11. For I have received, and this is Paul speaking, for I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. It's one covenant. Jesus was talking about bringing into place the new covenant as opposed to finishing the old covenant. When Jesus cried on the cross, it is finished. The plan of salvation was not complete at that time. What was finished at that moment, because the veil was torn in the temple, the way to the Holy of Holies was going to be opened. What he was declaring was finished was the old covenant. A covenant is an agreement between two or more parties, and they decide the terms. God and Jesus worked out the terms. You and I do not. You and I cannot break the covenant. The covenant is between our Heavenly Father and Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And neither one of them are going to break it. It is always good. We get into that covenant because when we make Jesus Christ our Lord, we become brothers and sisters of the Lord, but we're part of the family. And when it comes to covenant, when they used in, in a covenant-making ceremony, whoever cut the covenant, their whole family got the blessing or the curse. They used to give a whole bunch of blessings and curses. And when we look in the Old, Co Old Testament and in Deuteronomy, we see, here's the blessings. If you do all this, here's your blessings. And if you mess up, here's all the curses. And they both said, they agree. The two people standing in place. So we enter in when we're children of God. When we make Jesus Christ Lord of our life. We are blessed. And we have to realize God will never, ever, 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 will never, ever, ever curse one of his children. Because we're blessed. And it says, whom God has blessed will not be cursed. So we're a blessed people because of that. Not because we take communion. And I know later it, in about verse 29 it says, judge yourself. Many are sick and weak because you do not discern the Lord's body. And people have been in a place where they think it's got to be about sin. And they're afraid to take communion. Communion is open to every person who makes Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. If you believe that Jesus became a man and that he suffered on the cross, that he died and rose again and shed his blood, and you confess him as Lord, you're a child of God and communion's open to you. It's not whether we miss it or sin, because we all miss it and sin, and if we have to go back and try and figure out every miss and sin we've done, we are going to never take communion, we're never going to enter into any of the goodness of God, and we will think our suffering is something we deserve. 
No child of God deserves suffering. Amen. It's not from God and Satan's been defeated. So why do we suffer? Hosea 4, 6 says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. And one of the biggest ways we can start perishing is when we try and live and mix the old covenant and the new covenant. When we try and think we have to live according to the law and that God loves us and blesses us according to our works. Our works are never good enough. Yeah. Ever. But when we do it in Jesus, God sees us always in Jesus. He sees me through the blood of Jesus. Not because of anything I've done. It's because of Jesus. Verse 24, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24. And when he had given thanks, this is vital. There's always thanks. We're to be thankful people. He broke it and ta said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Why did Jesus do this? What was the purpose of him doing this? And that's important to know because if we don't know, we end up putting more emphasis on the um, idea of communion and we make it a doctrine and a tradition that we have to observe in a certain way as opposed to what was Jesus' purpose. God just doesn't, isn't willy-nilly, let's do this and see how it turns out. God has a specific plan and purpose for everything he does. He's an orderly God. He does things in order, according to plan. This is my body, which is broken for you. The purpose for communion is for us to stay in remembrance of what he has done on the cross. So he's telling his disciples, they had a meal, they celebrated the Passover, but then he said, he didn't say, remember the Passover. He was looking forward to what he was going to do on the cross, and he said, this do in remembrance of me, this is my body broken. This is my blood shed. He was looking forward to what they, he was going to do. And when the disciples saw what he did and they got revelation of it, they remembered that. Let's do this in remembrance of what Jesus has done. The real power of communion is the power of remembrance and thanksgiving. And we'll go further in this, but please understand. And I've got books and I've read books. And they say if you, there's healing in communion. So if you want healing, take communion. No, there isn't. There isn't healing in communion. It's very clear that if you want to be healed, you take the word. But wherein is the power of healing in communion? In remembrance of what Jesus has done and thanksgiving. But somehow through religion we've got our eyes on the elements and the act of taking communion instead of remembering what Jesus has done for us. Remembering his broken body and his shed blood. Therein is the healing. Proverbs uh, 4 around 20 says that the word of God is medicine. In Psalms, it says he sent his word and healed us. It doesn't say he take communion and you're healed. Communion is not medicine. The word is medicine. And the power of communion is remembering and thanksgiving. And apart from that, you can take communion all day long. Three times a day if you want. You can take it like, well, this, I've heard people, they say, well, we take it like medicine, so we're taking it three times a day. Well, if there's no remembrance and thanksgiving, you just tried to satisfy your hunger. There was a specific bread that they took, matzo bread, and it had stripes on it, and it had holes pierced in it. And the bread was significant of his body. 
the disciples understood that when he took that bread and broke it and said, this is my body. They understood the stripes and the holes, the piercings, his hands, his feet, his side, the thorns in his brow. Therein is the healing. So the act itself and the elements is not what brings deliverance. It's something that Jesus brought so we can remember what he did and start celebrating and being thankful and remembering what he did. And so when we take that bread, we now remember what he did and we speak forth what he did and we start celebrating and we're thankful for what he did. Do in remembrance of me. Remembrance of the finished work, his death, burial, and resurrection. What's happened is communion, and some say it's the Lord's Supper, some say communion, some are very fussy about the elements you take. It just really jarred me so many years ago when God told T.L. Osborne to have a communion service. And he said, I don't have the elements. And God said, there's a vending machine. Get the Coke and get the chips. You see, it's not what we're taking. Do we remember what he has done? Do we remember what he has done? The significance of the Lord's Supper is that it puts us in remembrance of the tremendous price Jesus paid for our salvation. And any deviation from this simple purpose is missing the true meaning of communion. I know people that have taken communion and taken communion because they misunderstood or they were taught wrong or they misunderstood the teaching and they think, if I take communion, I'll be healed. But it's very clear. If you discern not the body, it doesn't say if you don't discern the communion, but if you don't discern the body, there's many sick and weak among you. Now that is twofold meaning. One, the body, the broken body of Jesus. Two, it's the body of Christ. Don't ever come against a believer, a Christian, because they may go to a different church or they're of a different denomination. We don't come against the body of Christ that way, and we discern the body of Christ, his physical body that was broken for us. Amen. But it doesn't say if you mistake communion, you have to judge or you'll be sick doesn't say that. And I'm not making light of it, but we have to absolutely remember why and the purpose Jesus put it in place. Let's look at 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter 1, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, we have to remember what were we redeemed by. When we fail to remember what it costs Jesus to save us, we tend to treat our salvation cheaply and with disregard. We were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from our vain conversation or our vain way of life, received by tradition from our fathers. Next verse. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The blood of Jesus redeemed us. He said, do this in remembrance of me, my body and the blood. It costs the sinless, precious blood of Jesus to have us redeemed and bought out of Satan's dominion. We're to remember that. That's the purpose of the cup in communion. We're not to take our salvation what the price Jesus paid, matter-of-factly. We didn't deserve it. Bottom line, none of us deserved to be saved. None of us deserved what Jesus did for us. But it's only because of God's great love that Jesus came and we did receive salvation. It's his love, for God so loved. It's
it's important to realize Jesus suffered for us. Spirit, soul, and body. Our emotions. He suffered emotionally. He refused any type of painkiller but entered into the experience of the cross with all his faculties going. There was no dulling of his emotions or no dulling of pain. He took the full course, the full brunt of everything. No painkiller. No Tylenol. No Advil. No ibuprofen. No whatever else they have out there. And I'm not saying you shouldn't take it, but I'm saying he didn't. Zero painkiller is what he suffered for us so we can be redeemed. Don't allow the world or religion to give you painkillers where your mind is dulled and you cannot see the truth, where your soul becomes corrupt and you no longer have a prosperous soul because it says as our soul prospers, we'll be in health and we will prosper financially only according to our soul. Don't let the world tell you. Don't let religion tell you what God can and cannot do. He has already done all he's going to do. So let's get off our blessed assurance and quit waiting for him to do what he's already done. And let's start remembering what he's done for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as we take communion. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Romans 5, 8. We're going to look at some of the things that we've been, we have to remember. But God commended his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were sinners. We were there. What it's talking about is not doing things wrong. Because, but our sin nature, while we were still children of Adam with his nature, slaves of Satan, the Adamic sin nature in us, our spirit was dead to God. And he loved us. And at that time when we were in that place, I think sometimes we don't realize how lost we were. That maybe we think, oh, well, I was pretty good, so I might have made it on my own without Jesus. But he's just an add-on. Jesus is not an add-on. He is the engine. He's not the caboose. And in our lives and our lifestyles and our energies should go to Jesus as the engine and we're following him. Not trying to get him to be the caboose and following us. And there's a big difference. While we were sinners, Jesus died for us. That to me is amazing. It's amazing. So we have to remember with that, God's love is not conditional. His love is unconditional. Unconditional love. Don't put a condition on God's love. Don't let the world's thought of love dull your thinking towards God's love. You cannot do anything to get God to love you. And you might think, well, now that I've made Jesus Christ Lord of my life and I'm, a saved, I'm saved and I confess Jesus as Lord, God loves me. No. No, 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 no. He loved you. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. No, no. As we were sinners, he loved us so much that he gave Jesus ultimate price, ultimate love. And we didn't do anything to deserve it. When we receive communion, this is what we should be remembering. This is what we should be celebrating. That's why we take communion, to remember what Jesus did for us. To remember the love of God towards us. God never stops loving anyone. 
and there's nothing you can do to get him to stop loving you. And I know we may have had parents or friends or whosoever that if I don't meet a certain standard or I miss it somewhere, suddenly their love is not there in full strength. That's not God. Don't base God's love and judge God's love by what you may have experienced in the natural realm. He loves you no matter what you do. He loves you. He doesn't want you to mess up. He doesn't want you to be crazy. He doesn't want you to allow Satan a door, road, door, door into your life. But he still loves you with the same love. Always. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. Therefore, and now this is the great exchange. It's the great exchange. When you stop and think about what Jesus did, what he took for you. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Well, if we're in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's talking about your spirit. It's not talking about your mind. It's not talking about your body. It's talking about your spirit. Next verse. And all things are of God. Now notice, having, being a new creature, getting a new spirit is of who? Did you do anything to get it? Did you work for it? Did you deserve it? He has reconciled us to himself. We heard about the peace. Peace. The veil, our entrance into the Holy of Holies. Peace between God and man by Jesus Christ. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therein is our witnessing tool. That God loved you so much, he gave Jesus. That you're forgiven. All you need to do, you don't... People say, well, when you're going to get born again, confess your sins. Come on, who knows all the sins they ever did to be able to confess them to get born again. But people believe that. I've had people come to me with tears in their eyes saying, what am I going to do? I don't know if I actually confessed all my sins, I might have forgotten one. So am I really saved? All we need to do is believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Admit you're a sinner and you need a savior. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God did it. Not you and me. God did this for me. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. He has not imputed, put to my account my trespasses. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Please understand, this is huge. He, did, he put all my sins... All of them, past, present, future, on Jesus. And he's not holding them against me. Because if it isn't my future sins as well, then Jesus has to come back. But 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was crucified, I wasn't even born yet, and I hadn't done anything. But he paid the price for my sin. Now, people will take that and abuse that. Your sins are forgiven, but we are to repent if we want to walk in victory. And we don't want Satan to have an open door in our life. But also nowhere are we told to fight Satan. We're to resist him. And we resist him with the word of God. But God doesn't hold anything against me because he sees me through the finished work of Jesus. That's what we remember when we take communion. That's the purpose of communion. Next verse. Is there 21? Is there not another verse? Where is it? Well, I'm going to go to my Bible. What a concept. Um, 
that's 20. There it is. Yay. I didn't quite get to my Bible. For he hath made him to be sin. Jesus bore all our sin. Jesus was made to be sin for me. I remember that when I take communion. He was made to be sin. He didn't even know sin. He was not acquainted with sin. He never sinned. But he did it for one reason only. So you and I could be made the righteousness of God. Now what does that mean? So you and I could be in right standing with our Heavenly Father. So we could go boldly into the throne of grace and find help to, in time of need. We talk about wanting more grace. But the Bible says he gives more grace to the humble. When we realize it's because of Jesus, when we realize Jesus did it all, we then kick in by faith into the grace and the finished work of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans 5. These are things that when Jesus said, remember, do this in remembrance of me. It's a celebration. It's not just the act, it's not just the elements. <clears throat> Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's because everything produces after its own kind. We all came from Adam. Adam bowed his knee to, G to Satan. And so his dead spirit, him being alive to Satan, passed on to all of us. And that's what it's saying there. Because of that, all have sinned. Next verse. For until the law, sin was in the world. Now we had taught about this. God doesn't change his, what he does, but he changes how he deals with man. Here it is. The, uh, before the law, from Genesis to Moses, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there is no law. And so people have said, how come this person lied? Abraham lied. Why didn't God smack him upside the head? Because there was no law. There was no law. However, Jesus did pay for them. He, all sin, all sin, God hates all sin, and all sin must be paid for. And Jesus did it all. Next verse. For until the law there was no sin. Nevertheless, <clears throat> death reigned. Now, it's physical death, of course, reigned. But death, meaning spiritual death, reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. They may not have physically eaten from the wrong tree. They may not have necessarily bowed their knee to Satan, but they're still children of Satan. Who is the figure of him that was to come? But out as the offense, so is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead... And this is what I so like. Talked about needing more grace. More grace. Much more grace. Much more the grace of God. And the gift of grace. You don't work for grace. You humble yourself. There's more grace as you humble yourself. But you don't work for grace. It's a gift. And grace and truth came by Jesus. He's a gift. Which is by one man, Jesus Christ. And it has abounded to many. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a free gift. You and I can't work for it. You and I can't work for our salvation. You and I can't work for any of the promises of God. We receive them by faith, entering into the grace. Faith accesses what grace has provided. It's all by Jesus. Not as it, not, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Just as if I never sinned. Hallelujah. 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 
For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more. God always does much more. Much more they which receive. You have to receive the abundance of grace. And you have to receive the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now what does this mean here? Okay, death reigned because of what Adam did. But if you receive, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You realize you need a savior and you can't save yourself. You receive. You have to receive it. You can't work for it. You can't work for it. You receive it. I receive the abundance of grace. By my confession and what I've been led, I receive. And the gift of righteousness. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I just receive it. And therefore, I will reign as a king because he's made us priests and kings unto him. We're to reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Not by ourselves, not by our good works, but we reign in life by one Jesus Christ. The power of the resurrection belongs to us. I was crucified with Christ. I was raised with Christ. My old man was crucified with him. And I've been raised to newness of life. Hallelujah. This is what communion's about. This is what Jesus said. Remember. When you take communion, remember this. Remember this is my body. Remember my blood. It's just not the act of taking communion. It's the remembrance and the thanksgiving where the power is. Colossians 1, 12 to 14. Colossians 1, 12. Giving thanks. Well, that's something we're to do. Thanksgiving. Giving thanks unto the Father. Why? He's made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We have an inheritance in Jesus. Our inheritance is prosperity. Our inheritance is a new life. Our inheritance is a new spirit. Our inheritance is coming boldly into the throne of grace. Our inheritance is healing, prosperity. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Jesus. He's delivered us from the power of darkness. Don't ever, 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 don't ever think you've got a problem because Satan is after you. The only way he can do anything to you is if he deceives you and you speak his, pro his words of defeat over your life. He has zero authority. You have been taken out of his kingdom, totally out of his kingdom, and you've been put into the kingdom, the rule, the government of Jesus. And Jesus took all of that authority that Adam gave him away from Satan and he said, now you go in my name. But see, when we start looking again at ourselves and did I do everything right and did I say everything right? No, it's not my personal authority. It's Jesus' authority that I'm going in. And he's been given a name that's above every name. But be aware when you use the name of Jesus. Don't just add it on somewhere. It's a powerful thing, but we've been delivered. These are things to remember when you take communion. This is why when we have a communion service, we go through all of this because just to have a little at the end, okay, everybody's here's a wafer, here's a little thing of juice, okay missed you're ready to go you have misused and misunderstood the purpose of it and what Jesus said we have been delivered next verse in whom we have redemption we've been redeemed bought out of by his blood the forgiveness of sins don't let anyone Put you in condemnation. You see, 
We don't need to get free. We're free. We're free. Free from Satan's dominion. Chains, you might think you've got chains holding you. They're an illusion. You've allowed them through your imagination to be on you. Well, you might think this happened and growing up this happened and, and I've always done this. Well, we've seen supernatural change what to do. We've been studying the book, Prosperous Soul. We know what we're supposed to do, but we have to be willing to do it. And God's not going to make us do it. We have been removed from living under the curse. And every battle, Jesus has already defeated Satan and has won. And we're to go forward speaking his word. As I said, we don't fight Satan, we resist him. And we resist him with the word. Quit giving him place. Quit allowing yourself to think he's got so much control in your life. And what you did back there should not be controlling you today. Don't let your past life, your past behavior, your past actions determine your future. Determine today. Repent. Change the way you think. But you can only change the way you think as you behold the word of God. As you behold Jesus. And part of that's communion, remembering what he's done for us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. As many as were astonished at him. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. He didn't look human. He didn't look human. At the cross, I think it was the centurion that said, truly, this must have been the Son of God. Later, he got born again. Truly. Truly, this must have been the Son of God. You see, other people have been put on a cross. Anyone put on a cross, it says they're cursed. So he was, Jesus was cursed when he went on that cross. He took the curse. A lot of people were beaten with stripes. But I believe he didn't look human because he was bearing the curse, but he was taking the spiritual part of it. You see, all of that came out of Adam. The curse came out of Adam, and that was spiritual when his spirit died and became alive to Satan. And Isaiah 53, verse 1, what we've been sharing this morning what Jesus has done for us. It says, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? You have to make a decision if you believe it. You have to make a decision. Do I believe this? And if I believe it, then I'll meditate on it and it'll change my life and it'll change the way I think. And you on your own read all the way through. Isaiah 53, it talks what Jesus suffered and what he did. Let's go to Colossians 2.15. It's a description of the battle that took place in hell. And having, this is where he was, he spoiled principalities and powers. The hosts of hell, Satan and his hosts were in hell. He spoiled them. He took all their goods from them. And he made a show of them openly. He triumphed, triumphed over them. He put off from himself. You see, before Jesus was raised from the dead, he had a fight. Luke eleven twenty one. Luke eleven twenty one. When a strong man armed keeps his place. His goods are in peace. So Satan was a strong man. 
and he was keeping his goods in his palace in hell. He had the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He had dominion. He took Adam's dominion. Next verse. But, but when a stronger than he shall come upon him, when a stronger shall come into hell, into his supposed palace, and he's stronger than him, he will overcome him and take from him all his armor in which he trusted and divide his spoils. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, I've heard people pray, we have to bind the strong man. Nonsense. Stop it. He's been bound. Jesus bound him and took from him the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And got dominion back. And Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Now you go. You go in my name. You go in my authority. And Satan cannot stand against us because he has nothing to come against you and me with but deception. And those are lies. The same as he did against Adam and Eve, he could do nothing but lie. Get them to believe something negative about God. Well, God doesn't love me when I do this. Well, I'm not good enough for this. Well, I wonder if, and allow ourselves to get under condemnation. Those are deception and lies from Satan. Satan's weapons, deception, and from there, fear. And the minute he can get us into fear, He's got us defeated. You see, Adam's sin gave Satan dominion, and Satan then breathed his nature into him. We become, hear this carefully, we become who we listen to. Who are you obeying today? We are a slave to whoever we obey. And yes, Satan is defeated. But if we believe his lies and entertain his lies, he has got us defeated. That becomes a stronghold in our life. As we obey the word and do what Jesus told us to do, Satan has Zero authority and ability in our life. And you know what? It says, we will suffer persecution in this life. It doesn't say we have to suffer poverty and sickness and disease or emotional trauma. And if any of those things come against us, it's not God trying us, and don't ever get to this place, well, I'm just suffering for Jesus. The only suffering we do is when we have to love the unlovely and allow persecution to come against us. Don't believe a lie. That's all he can do. That's all we have to suffer. Never ever should we suffer what Jesus paid the price for and what he's redeemed us from. I'm just going to read. I want us to go to Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Just leave it there for a moment. And I, I, I went over this before, but through Christ we will never receive any curse from God, even though we still obey the law in some way. There's three basic Greek words for redeemed. I'm not going to try and pronounce the Greek words, but one is to buy in the slave market. We were slaves to the law, having to obey Satan. The next one is to buy out of the slave market. It would remove us out from under the principle of the law. 
So one is a slave under the law. The other Greek word is to buy us out from under. Now in Deuteronomy 28, 1, it said that if you will hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God and do that and keep all his commandments, these blessings shall come upon you. Well, we have those blessings, but people have focused on verse 1 about keeping the law. We cannot. They couldn't. But Jesus kept the full law, and Jesus, it says, is the fulfillment of the law. And because he kept the whole law, and when I get born again, I am in him, and God sees me through Jesus' blood, it's as if I kept the whole law. God deals with the spirit, and it's time we become more spirit conscious than mental and emotional. The third Greek is to set free or release by a payment. And that comes from Wu's word studies from the New Greek Testament. To set free or release by a payment. You have to ask yourself, was Jesus' death, burial, resurrection? Stripes. All of it. Was it enough? It says we were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. And that was enough. Christ's death paid in full the justice of the law demanded. We are now free from the law to be in union with another. And his name is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Carolyn, please stand. <clears throat>